As the 20th century progressed through the first few decades, change was rapid fire all around in science, in technology, in politics, economics, and most certainly within the arts. With the mechanized slaughter of machine and gas of the First World War, artists were repulsed and demanded that there must be a new way for reason to be. And of course, reason responded with a roaring 1920s and a rise of film culture that led to uh, economic collapse and the gangsterism and dirty 30s. Evidently, the show was not over. As we looked at in part one, Sybil learned her artistic craft very much based on the more traditional art forms of the late 19th century. And we saw in her architectural dry points all of the key tenets that would have come up, come out from a, a more classical approach to art with a sense of composition and a sense of light and shadow and a sense of volume and form. Uh, all being depicted in what would be seen as a very realistic way. But as she uh, progressed through the 1920s and with the influence of Claude Flight in the Grosvenor School, we find Sybil in 1929 producing works such as Concert Hall on the right-hand side that was made in 1929, a dramatic departure from where she began the 1920s to where she would end it. The early 1930s are a great time of experimentation for Sybil and her art. We can see in these two works from the year 1930 just how simplified the forms have become for Sybil. As we see Rush Hour on the left with depicting legs on an escalator and just the absolute simplicity of geometry but a love of the curve and just a love of a sense of motion but reducing everything to very basic forms and no sense of fuss or ornament. Sybil had no use for artifice or any extra detail or extraneous detail. We can see on the right with Gale of 1930, again, just um, a sense of motion throughout the picture, strong sense of the wind, and yet these curvilinear forms fighting against it um, with the very geometric bodies, very simplified bodies, and overall a very simple composition in really only three colors, um, something that she became a master at uh, with the lino cut print is the reduction of color, but being able to pull forth from the color a very wide spectrum of emotion. Over the next few slides, we'll take a look at some of the thematic content that ran through Sybil's work basically throughout her career. In this slide, we're looking at sports and sporting activities, uh, something that Sybil uh, worked on very much during the 1930s, as we see works like Water Jump on the left of 1931, uh, Speedway up in the top right of 1934, and Football of 1937. Um, again, displaying very much uh, the interests of Sybil in, in a you know, very strong relationship between positive and negative space, uh, very much uh, engaged with um, the diagonal and the angle and uh, obviously geometry, um, especially geometry in the form. Um, Sybil didn't believe in extra detail or extraneous detail, as I mentioned before, um, feeling instead that if you can't express the emotion and express the dynamism within the overall form and composition, then you're not being successful in what do you need detail for. Another theme that Sybil returned to time again was the theme of labor 
and it's certainly something we'll see in her Campbell River years later on. But uh, during the 1930s, uh, she very much had a focus in her work on the working man in labor, and of course she um, had worked in both of the war efforts as a welder in the First World War, working in an airplane factory. In fact, being someone that worked on the very first all-metal fabrication of the airplane, uh, and then during the Second World War with her work in the shipyards. Um, so she would have been very closely working alongside uh, the working class and a very sh much shoulder-to-shoulder -shoulder with them. What we're looking at is a very interesting uh, composition entitled The Giant Cable or The New Cable uh, early in the 30s of 1931. Um, but we see all of the classic tenets of, of what Sybil has come to work on. Um, very much a diagonal composition, uh, very large negative space, especially in top left, a very solid foundation in the, uh, in the blocks that the figures are standing on, um, and just a, a sense of strength and movement and effort that's being put into working with this giant cable, uh, again, in, in very geometric and reduced forms, um, but very complicated in, in this kind of rhythmic progression as they move through the diagonal. A very impressive um, set of compositional uh, aspects that Sybil's included in this work. Continuing on the theme of labor, uh, we're looking in the top left at uh, a piece called Sledgehammers from 1933. And again, a, a very strong sense of positive and negative space uh, and a very powerful sense of these blacksmiths uh, hammering away with a very kind of circular dynamic and in many ways reminiscent of vorticism as it draws you into the center of the composition. But again, scaled down forms, very geometric um, forms, uh, diagonal, swirling, and note here also absolutely no facial expressions, um, just blocks. Again, keeping with, with Sybil's belief that uh, if you wanted to express emotion and dynamism, you had to do it through the overall form and composition, not with any kind of detail or the need for facial content. And again, just a quick comment on the color of sledgehammers um, with the uh, eye being drawn to the center of the composition. Uh, we also see from the color the glow uh, on the skin, on the faces and the arms of the men at work, uh, contrasting against the much cooler blues and greens of the background. Uh, you get a real sense of a focus of energy on that central hammering and the heat uh, of their efforts. In the lower right corner, we have the winch, uh, a little earlier piece from 1930, um, but again with this very circular dynamism, uh, very reflective of the movement of a winch and its circular pattern, and how the bodies and the background are participating in that vortex of energy that it would take to move a winch. Um, again, very reduced geometry, a very reduced color palette, and uh, a very exquisite sense of the use of negative space in the, in the uh, composition that is contributing to that circular swirling uh, motion of the overall print. And in both of these pieces, it's almost as if sound is a part of the visual composition. In Sledgehammers, we see in the blues and the greens just radiating away from the center, like the clanging of the hammers. And in the bottom winch, we see the radiating lines, uh, the vortex, as if it's grinding with the, uh, with the effort of the winch. Uh, very wonderful use of, of color and, and uh, composition and geometry to suggest the sound of the scene as well. I'm going to use this print entitled Flower Girls from 1934 as a crossover from the theme of labor uh, and move into a look at her agricultural works or her, her rural-based work. Sybil, of course, had a, a rural upbringing and was very observant of the landscape around her and of the, uh, the work in the 
of the farmers uh, and the workers in the fields. Um, and of course, this this flower girl's image uh, is uh, certainly depicting uh, the strength of these women as they're working against the sheer gravity and weight of these baskets. Um, and, you know, very angular geometry, again, very block uh, forms, uh, simple color, um, but offset with these two slashing pointed diagonals in the lower left against what is really essentially an empty background, but just enough detail to suggest shadow and a very interesting compositional uh, addition uh, to complete the overall picture that Sybil's added here. Um, and again, you, you can sense the, the toil uh, of the flower girls. Um, and as I say, probably a crossover between labor and perhaps a more urban print uh, as the girls are taking flowers to market, um, but certainly suggestive of the rural background that they have taken the flowers from. And moving out into the rural landscape with tillers of 1934, um, we start to see Sybil very much playing with the, uh, the perspective of her compositions. Uh, in the previous Flower Girls, it was almost as if we had a bird's eye view of them. And as we look at Tillers of the Soil, the composition is coming at us. The ground is spilling out into the foreground of the bottom of the, of the print, and the horses are marching towards us, uh, really displaying their their strength. Um, again, through geometry, uh, we can see the reduced figure in the background uh, running the, uh, the till or the plow, um, but offset with just enough background detail with the birds to keep the eye moving around the picture, to, to give it a, a real sense of motion. Um, and then uh, just the uh, the imbalance of the composition with uh, the suggestion of a, of a tree on the uh, on the left hand side and then the open sky uh, as it leads it fades off into the the top right um, very complicated perspective and uh, very interesting um, viewpoint from the ground from the soil of which the tillers are toiling In this print entitled Michaelmas of 1935, we truly are seeing a, a bird's eye view now looking down on the composition um, and very much in earth tones as we're watching the laborers spread muck, uh, apparently from the Suffolk uh, region uh, in England. Um, but, you know, offset with these very strong red radiating wheels, um, and just deep brown, deep earth tones that um, that just enhance that sense that uh, of working the land and and working in the ground. Another interesting composition with Fall of the Leaf from 1934 where the emphasis is moving away from the labor of, uh, of the farmers and, and the effort of the horses as they become diminished in scale and, uh, and much more emphasis on the kind of landscape and the land and the grandeur of the landscape in which uh, people toil uh, rurally. Um, but it's no simple landscape, very much uh, with her, her kind of dynamic uh, swirling and um, and upending of the ground and there's no kind of flatness anywhere uh, that keeps the eye moving and roving and, and just suggests the the overall motion of uh, daily life within the uh, within the rural landscape um, and very stylized trees um, which I'm, I'll talk more about in the next slide. I'd just like to take a moment to speak about Art Deco, which had a great influence on visual arts and architecture and design uh, all through the 1920s and 1930s. The name was short for Arts Decoratifs uh, and emerged from the International Exhibition of Modern Decorative and Industrial Arts that was held in Paris in 1925. And it went on to become a, a very international um, style 
that drew on a lot of different cultural influences. Um, but in, in, in basic terms, it, it uh, had very bold ge geometric forms and, and radiating energies. Um, this is not something that uh, Sybil, you know, ever admitted to or really had much uh, value in the sort of current decorative uh, fussiness as she would see it. But as we look at the, um, the, the previous print that we just saw, The Fall of the Leaf from 1934, it is rather undeniable in the stylization of the trees that... Um, Art Deco, which would be all around her, would suddenly start creeping into, uh, in creeping into her art. Um, I mean, they shared basically the same roots coming out of Cubism and uh, Vorticism and Futurism, um, just much more stylized than had previously been uh, practiced in the visual arts. We've moved through a number of themes uh, that Sybil addressed in her art through the 1920s and 1930s, um, looking at sports and then looking at labor, uh, and labor within a, an urban context, moving to uh, a more rural context for farm life and farming, um, and then also an increasing interest in the landscape uh, of the rural experience. Um, and lastly, we're going to look at um, the subject of religion, which Sybil practiced in her art and in her in, in her life, uh, throughout her life, um, she was uh, a Christian scientist and had a very strong faith. Though speaking to her students, um, she didn't speak about her faith often to them, but it certainly showed up uh, in in her works. We are looking here. Uh, at a work from 1935 uh, entitled Via Della Rosa, which would be part of the Stations of a Cross series that Sybil, as I mentioned before, continued to work on throughout her life. Um, but we do see a, a, a very interesting uh, use of composition to reinforce subject matter as um, we see really two kind of basic diagonals uh, intersecting with each other, very reflective of the shape of a cross, um, with a very strong movement of the cross itself and the, uh, the kind of slave holding the cross, uh, moving from the right to the top left corner. Um, but the figures coming out of the bottom left corner and radiating up towards the right um, definitely counterbalance uh, each other and create this strong sense, sense of a crossing of diagonals. Um, and the, the, the use of positive and negative space uh, contributing to the solidity of, of, the, uh, of the overall composition. And the color, you know, very earth tones, uh, a very strong sense of the somber and of the struggle uh, and tragedy that's, under, that's, that's taking place like a piece of staged theater before us. We're looking here at a piece entitled Mother and Son from 1932, which depicts uh, Mary grieving uh, at the cross uh, for her son. And again, the, the use of, of geometries to express emotion um, with the you know, sense of the weight of the hanging Christ from the cross and just the sense of grief uh, clinging to the cross in, in the mother uh, yet again no facial expression everything is mournful um, and, uh, and, and a sense of gravity to the situation strictly through the use of again geometries and uh, a rising out of the ground in terms of a compositional uh, intent. We also see in the right hand side just enough of the of a leaning uh, cross to give a, a good sense of counterweight or counterbalance to the leaning of the cross that Christ is on and also just provides a, a very good sense of balance to the geometries of the grieving figures uh, on the ground at Christ's feet. And one more look at uh, a religious print, um, this one entitled Joseph and Nicodemus from 1932, uh, showing 
the removal of Christ from the cross and the taking, uh, carrying of his body, and a, a, a much more jumbled kind of composition showing the, the kind of great confusion of the time, uh, just a great sense of weight and grief in, in the picture, um, and uh, the, the color choices of uh, very, again, somber greens, dark blues and blacks, browns, yet Christ's body very illuminated with orange, um, very much showing uh, a divinity or a faith that is being carried, uh, even though its weight is heavy, uh, there's a lightness through the use of color. And as we come to the conclusion of part two, I'm showing two landscape works from the 1930s on the left storm of 1935 and on the right tumulus of 1936 and I've chosen these works because they're very prescient of of what is to come in Sybil's career and life as she moves uh, into the Second World War but uh, post Second World War for her life in Campbell River where certainly the kinds of storm that we see depicted, uh, the jumbleness and complexity of the trees um, are very much what she will find uh, in Campbell River. <laughs>